So as we start Matthew chapter 2, we're, let's just read some of them and then we'll just uh, talk about some stuff here. Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came, from, uh, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw he stars when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem in Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come to ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod assumed wise men secretly and ascertain, uh, ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and <clears throat> when you have found him, Bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they, uh, that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So, as you can see here, this is the, the literally story of the birth of Jesus Christ. And obviously, we're going to talk about some story of the birth of Christ in Bethlehem. But before we talk about the uh, birth of Jesus Christ, let's just talk about some um, the historical fact of Herod. And uh, in order for us to really understand who Herod is, it literally has to go back to the uh, uh, old history, uh, exactly um, who is the, uh, the Herod. So we're going to talk about some of the historical fact uh, about Herod. So let me just talk about um, exactly um, who is Herod. We have to go all the way back into the time when... Um, The uh, the Syrian, which is the um, Ptolemy and the the what's more called the uh, Seleucus, they when they were actually having a hundred and fifty year war between them, the Syrian war, there's like first the Syrian war, the second Syrian wars, and third and, and fourth and fifth. There's a lot of story behind it. So I, I'm not gonna go all the way up, you know, from the uh their first generations, but I'm gonna have to talk about somewhere in the middle of the uh the Syrian war. So I'm gonna talk about the uh the Seleucus the third, uh, he's um, after the Seleucus the third, he's a son, which is the Seleucus fourth. Uh, his name was uh, the Philippatar. Um, literally, what happened was. Between the uh, the war, the Ptolemy was literally um, ruling the Egypt area, whereas the Seleucus um, dynasty was ruling most of the the regions where 
um, the um, Babylonians, as well as the um, um, what you call. Let me actually show some of the map here. Let me see if I can show. One second. <clears throat> the Dochi Kingdom here. Okay, so let me just share my screen. Do you see a uh, screen here? Mm -hmm. So the area where you see in this area, like this, the purplish color is ruled by the, uh, the Ptolemy uh, dynasty and light yellow over here was ruled by Seleucus dynasty. Uh, so you will see the Seleucia over here. So he was literally just ruling much bigger, which is the, uh, what, um, uh, what you call the, um, oh, why am I going so blank on this one? Uh, the Persian empire was ruled. And they were fighting between the two dynasty for 150 years. And the Seleucus uh, was literally ruling and they were keep fighting back and forth. And while they are fighting, as I mentioned, when uh, uh, Seleucus IV, Pelopator, was ruling at the time, and he was to keep invading into uh egypt area but while they're fighting between the two obviously the rome which is right here was actually gaining more power and seleucus and uh, ptolemy was uh, losing their power because of the long years of the war between the two and when seleucus actually invaded into the area of uh, egypt Rome was actually helping Ptolemy and he was actually asking for um, the money to be paid to Rome because the damage they caused for the Romans. So Seleucus had to really pay the, uh, the money uh, to the Romes and that was a lots of money that they had to pay. And since they had to pay uh since they have to pay the war indemnity it was just a limited what Seleucus could do because they running out of money so what happened was his son was actually captured as um ransom in Rome until he pays all these indemnities, his son will be captured and not, will not be released. So since he was, you know, short on money, what he did was he actually just invaded into Jerusalem because he heard the news that in Jerusalem there's uh, lots of money hidden in the, uh, the, uh, in the, uh, the temple. So there is... Um, so he sent actually the uh the messenger um he he sent the me uh, the messenger Heliodorus Heli uh Helio Heliodorus and then trying to just to uh, bring that money back to them so he can pay to Rome the story of what happened when he actually uh went to Jerusalem to really get the money 
that is uh, recorded in the um, uh, the Second Maccabee chapter three. Is there anyone who actually read the Second Maccabees? Okay, so when you read the the Second Maccabees chapter three, it talks about the uh, when Heliodorus reached the uh, Jerusalem, what happened there, and he was literally just a you know, try to just steal the money, but, you know, God really just strike them, and he was literally beaten by the angels. And that story is recorded there. So when you read the second Maccabee chapter 3, you would understand exactly what happened there. But later on, what happened is Heliodorus assassinated uh, Seleucus the, the fourth. And uh, he's, this, uh, Seleucus the fourth wanted to, have his son to be the uh, successor when he dies. But since he was assassinated, he didn't have that opportunity to make his son to be the successor. So instead, his brother became the successor because he wanted the power. So literally, after the, uh, the death of the Seleucus the, the his brother... Um, Seleucus uh, his uh, Seleucus the, the fourth brother he's, his name was uh, Mitradades Mitradades changed his name to uh, Antikos the fourth Epipanus the reason he changed his name to Antiochus is because in the Ptolemy, uh, they, he used the uh, name uh, Epipanus. Epipanus means the God appeared. So he wanted to just to promote himself to be the God. And even though he called himself Epipanus, the Jews used to call him Epimanus. Epimanus means madman. So when you think of this Antiochus the fourth Epipanus, he was the worst uh, the king for Jews. So when you look at the Jewish history, his name pops up quite often. And he's the one who actually persecuted the Jews the most. Um, so from his uh, achievements and what he did uh, for the, his own country, he was a good king in a sense that he expanded the territory pretty big. And he literally just... Uh, uh, took over most of the Egypt as well when he was ruling. Uh, but because of his persecutions to Jew, that's where the revolt started. So let's talk about some of his history. When his father, which is uh, Antiochus III, when he was defeated by the Romes, he was captured as a ransom, and he was stayed in Rome for 13 years as a ransom. While he was staying as a ransom in Rome, he learned the politics, and he learned the cultures, he learned philosophy, and he learned a lot of the, uh, um, the cultures of the Romes. And he was amazed and he was literally became astonished by the how Romes were actually ruling their own country. So he fell in love with the way the Romes actually ruling their, uh, their way. And after his father, I mean not father, his brother Seleucus the, the, uh, the, the third was assassinated by the Helio, uh, Heliodorus and he became... A king and uh, he wanted to just like 
uh, claim that the Egypt is Egypt is belonged to him, and Ptolemy claimed that Egypt belongs to Ptolemy's dynasty, and they were just having arguments and they were just to keep fighting each other. So they they both asked the Ptolemy and the Seleucus uh, dynasty asked the Romes to be the mediator to determine who owns the Egypt. But Rome did not actually want to interfere their arguments. And um, Rome did not really just help neither Ptolemy or the Seleucus uh, dynasty at all. But Antiochus IV, he actually continued to attack Egypt and he literally just won the war and took the, the entire regions of Egypt. And uh, as I mentioned, when he was ruling, he expanded the Seleucus the territory as big as he could. Um, but when you go back to the historical fact, when his father was having a war between the Ptolemy uh, dynasty, and then he was defeated by the Rome, and Rome suggested it, you need to have a, you know, um, the peace between the two dynasty. So as a sort of the a gesture of having the peace, the the uh, Seleucus the four, uh, the third gave his daughter to Ptolemy and married to the Ptolemy dynasty. That daughter that. Uh, Seleucus III gave to Ptolemy is um, she, yeah she is the Cleopatra but this is not the Cleopatra that you know the Cleopatra that you know is the Cleopatra the seventh I see. this is the Cleopatra the first so don't get mixed up with the Cleopatra that, that you know it is the most beautiful woman in, in the world. Okay, so don't get confused. It's just the first Cleopatra the first and not the Cleopatra seventh. So Cleopatra the first, which is the daughters of the uh, uh, Seleucus the third, married to, uh, to Ptolemy. Um, and Ptolemy fifth, and the Cleopatra the first married and had a son. That is the Ptolemy the sixth. So when Antiochus IV invaded into Egypt, literally he invaded into his um, nephew's land. When you think about it, right? Because that is her, he's a sister's son, right? And the Ptolemies. So literally, he invaded into his uh, uh, nephew's land, and um, most of the part in Egypt, he literally just started to rule that area. But the area where he could not um, control was Alexandria, which is right here, this circle here, Alexandria. This area was not ruled by the uh, Antiochus IV. So, the people of Alexandria revolt. The fight against the uh, the tol um, fight against the uh, um, the uh, Seleucus, and then he actually they had the Ptolemy the sixth, uh, the brother Ptolemy the eighth to become the king. And at that time, while the Seleucus and the Ptolemy was fighting back and forth, since they, they were just paying attention to their own Syrian war, what happened is there is a, the person named uh, Yason. Yason was the, the Jews. And he literally just spread the, uh, the, um, the news that Antiochus IV died in the battle even though he was a, you know he was alive so he spread this 
um, the news that the Antiochus IV has died, and then many of the people in in Jerusalem and uh, Israel they started to raise up their own power to fight against the uh, the Seleucus the dynasty. So, because there's a lot of revolt is occurring in Israel, he had to pull back his, his uh, uh, the armies back from the Egypt. And he actually plays some of the, the powerful armies in Israel. And since the Yasson was the one who was spreading this, this false news, Antiochus IV was really mad. He was not happy. So he wanted to remove the many people in, in Jerusalem. So when he in, um, went to Jerusalem, what he did was he captured a lot of the Jews and sold them as a slaves and destroyed and they killed many of the Jews. And according to the, uh, the history, he killed at least 40,000 Jews when he entered into the Jerusalem. And also he placed the, uh, the governor, Phillips, which was really just like cruel uh, governors in Jerusalem. And after he actually invaded into Jerusalem, what he did was he just uh, asked the Jews or the the, the people of Israel to pay enormous amount of taxes. Not only he took all the gold and silvers from the temple and uh, the, um, the palace of the David, he literally stripped down all the gold and all the, uh, the silvers out of that and he, he took it and also imposed a lot of the taxes to the Jews. All kinds of taxes, the poll taxes, crown taxes, temple taxes. So, whenever they, uh, the harvest, they had to pay half of their, their gathering and pay as a taxes. And they had to pay also um, the uh, taxes for the, uh, their, their salt from the Dead Seas. So, since Antiochus, he imposed too much of a taxes, People in Israel could not live normal life. And then sometimes when, he, when the people could not pay the, the taxes, literally he destroyed the cities or he you know, invaded into the cities and sold the entire the town as a slave and sold it to some, uh, the other people. So because of this kind of uh, um, the persecutions, people are not happy. And then, um, when Antiochus, after he actually invaded into uh, the Israel, um, he restructured his army and he started to invade it back into Egypt again. That was the BC 167, and he was preparing for this another war with the, the Egypt, which is the Ptolemy the Sixth. And Ptolemy the Sixth, he reached out to Rome and asked for help. So the Rome was actually, hmm, okay, I could utilize this as an opportunity to to really just to have a control of a Ptolemy as well as defeat the Seleucus because the Rome wanted to just to take both of the the dynasty together. So the Rome sent the general to a fight against the Seleucus when he invaded to Egypt. And then the, the general who came from the Rome's wins uh, the uh, Antiochus IV reached the, uh, to Egypt, he literally drew the circles around him. You cannot take any of the land outside of the circle. If you take any of it, we will kill you. So, Antiochus literally has seen the power of Rome. So, he could not really 
uh, have a war against the Romans. So he was afraid to fight against the Romans. So he had to pull back. And while he was pulling back, he was mad. He was upset. And what, what he did was, as he was pulling back his army, he came back to Jerusalem again. So when you, when you look at this, the map again, so when he went to Egypt, in order for him to go back, they have to pass the uh, Jerusalem to get back to where he came from. So it's in the Jerusalem, it is in the path. So when he was uh, pulling back and reached to Jerusalem, he was upset. He was mad. So literally, he wanted to destroy the Jerusalem and the temple side. And obviously, he was obsessed with the Hellenism at the time. So he forced the Jewish people to give up their own religion and to worship and follow the Hellenism, which is to worship Zeus. So what he did was he sent about 20, uh, 22,000 the soldiers to uh, Jerusalem and then he literally killed uh, many of the Jews and also sold many of the people as a slaves. And the wall that Nehemiah restored was literally destroyed. And then they literally took the entire the, uh, the city of uh, uh, David. And then... What Antiochus IV said is, hey, since you have to give up all your um, own religion and follow the, uh, the Zeus, you cannot give sacrifice lamb at the temple and you cannot uh, follow Passover. You cannot do any of the feast and the temple and the priest should be cursed and remove what's in your temple and put the Zeus. And then after he put the Zeus statues in the temple, he literally brought all this, um, the pigs into the temple and killed the pigs in the temples and pour that pigs blood into the temples before the Zeus. And then they dis, uh, forbid the, the babies to be um, uh, babies not to be uh, circumcised and all the law they should not follow and if they don't follow the rules then that will kill you. That is recorded in the first Maccabees chapter one. And let me see if I can find that. Okay, here it is. So when you look at here from here to this, then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that each should give up his customs. All the Gentiles accepted the commands of the kings. Many even from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. And the king sent a letter to messenger to Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. He directed them to follow customs strange to the land. To forbid the burnt offerings and sacrifices and drink offerings in the sanctuaries to profane the Sabbath and feast. To defile the sanctuary and the priest. To build altars and sac uh, sacred uh, precin uh, precincts and shrines for idols. To sacrifice swine and unclean animals. And to leave their sons uncircumcised. They were to make themselves abominable by everything unclean and profane, so that they should forget the law and change all the ordinance, and whoever does not obey the commands of the king shall die. So, you could imagine how Israel p 
people reacted. Of course, some of the Israel people, because they were afraid, they literally followed this instructions or the command that was given by Antiochus IV. But since this temples and their feasts and all their um, the uh, 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 all the customs has been you know forbid obviously many of the Israels the faithful Israel especially the priest were so mad so some of the stories I actually did mention uh, when I was going over the uh, Daniel um, so when you go back to uh, Daniel chapter 7, there is a story that, uh, actually, let's just take a look at Daniel chapter 7 for a moment. Daniel chapter 7. When you read the chapter uh, 7, Verse 25, it says this, He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall drink to change the time and the law and they shall be given into his hands for a time, times, and half a times. So, during the time that Antiochus IV was actually persecuting and forbid all their uh, Jews' law, this is the time is two and a half years. Which is what we talked about in the revelations and how many times, uh, um, uh, not how many times, how many years that will be, the believers will be persecuted. And that's literally what happened during that time. So, in order for Antiochus and his, the governors was identifying the faithful Jews were very simple. What he did was, all these faithful Jews would not eat any swines. So what he did was, actually, he put the swines in the middle of the table, and then had the people come and have them eat. If they don't eat, they're going against the Antiochus, the commands. So they killed them. And... As I mentioned, they put the, uh, the Zeus statues in the middle of the temples and have them worship Zeus and pour swine's blood. And obviously, a lot of the faithful priests and the Jews were so um, mad. So when you look at the, uh, the Maccabees the chapter 1 verse, uh, we're going to read from here. According to the decree, they put to death the woman who had their children circumcised and their families and those who circumcised them, and they hung the infants from their mother's necks. But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They choose to die rather than to be defiled by food or profane the holy covenant, and they did, uh, they did die and very great wrath came upon Israel. So some of the story that you will see here is this. Which is the story you may not have read yet, but eventually you will, you will get to this. But I'm going to just you know, share some of the stories here. We're going to read about this. It happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compiled, uh, compelled by the king under for, uh, torture with whips and cords to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. One of them acting as their spokesman and said, What do you intend to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress the law of our fathers. The king fell into a rage and gave orders that pans and cauldrons be heated these were heated immediately and he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman be cut out 
and that they scalp him and cut off his hands and feet while the rest of the brothers and mothers looked on. When he was utterly helpless, the king ordered them to take him to the fire, still breathing, and to fry him in a pan. The smoke from the pan spread widely, but the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die, nobly saying, The Lord God is watching over us, in truth has compassion on us. As Moses declared in his song, which bore witness against the people to their faces, when, he said, and he will have a compassion on his servants. After the first brother had died in this way, they brought forward a second for the dear sport. They tore off the skins of his head with their hairs and asked him, Will you eat rather than have your body punished limb by limb? He replied in the language of his father and said to them, No. Therefore he in underwent torture as the first brother had done. And when he was at his last breath, he said, You cursed wretch, you dismiss us from this present life, but the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. After him, the third was the victim of this uh, dear sport. When it was demanded, he quickly put out his tongue and courageously stretched forth his hands and said nobly, I got these from heaven, and because of the, his law, I disdained them, and from, his, uh, from him, I hoped to get them back again. As a result, the king himself and those with him were astonished at the young man's spirit, for he regarded his sufferings as nothing. When he too had died, they maltreated and tortured the fourth in the same way, and when he was near death, he said, One cannot but choose to die at the hand of a man and cherish the hope of God's gifts the being raised again by him. But for you, were, uh, you, there will be no resurrections to life. Next, they brought forth the fifth and maltreated him, but he looked at, the, look at, looked at the king and said, Because you have authority among men, mortal through you are, you do, not, uh, you do what you please, but do not think that God has forsaken our people. Keep on. And see how his mighty power will torture you and your descendants. After him, they brought forth the sixth. And when he was about to die, he said, Do not deceive yourself in vain, for we are suffering these things on our own account because of our sins against our own God. Therefore, astounding things have happened, but do not think that you will go unpunished for having tried to fight against the God. The mother was especially admirable and worthy of an honorable memory. Though she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, she bore it with good courage because of her hope in the Lord. She encouraged each of them in the language of their fathers, filled with noble spirit. She fired her woman's reasoning with the man's courage and said to them, I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not... I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set an, in order to uh, in order the element within each of you. Therefore, the Creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of a man and devised the origin of all things, with will in His mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourself for the sake of His law. Antiochus felt that he was being treated with contempt, and he was suspicious of her reproach tone. The younger brothers being still alive, Antiochus not only appealed to him in words, but promised with oath that he would make him rich and, and uh, enviable if he, he would turn from the ways of his fathers, that he would take him for his friends and entrust him with public affairs. Since the young man would not listen to him at all, the king called the mother to him and urged her to advise the youth to save himself. After much urging on his part, she undertook to persuade uh, her son, but leaning close to him, she spoke in their native tongue as follows, uh, deriding the cruel tyrant, my son, have pity on, uh, pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb and nursed you for three years and have uh, reared you and brought you up this point in your life, and have taken care of you. I beseech you, my child, to 
Look at the heavens and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize God did not make them out of things that exist. Though also mankind comes into being, do not fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death so that in God's mercy I may get you back again with your brothers. While she was still speaking, the young man said, What are you waiting for? I will not obey the king's commands, but I obey the commands of the law that was given to our fathers through Moses. But you, who have con contrived all sorts of evil against the Hebrews, will certainly not escape the hands of God, for we are suffering because of our own sins. And if our living Lord is angry for the little while to rebuke and discipline us, he will again be reconciled with his own servants. But you, unholy wretch, you most defiled of all men, do not be uh, alienated in vain and puffed up by uncertain hopes. When you raise your hands against the children of heaven, you have not escaped the judgment of the Almighty. All seeing God for our brothers after enduring a brief suffering have drunk of overflowing like under God's covenant. But you, by the judgment of God, will receive just punishment for your arrogance. I, like my brothers, Give up body and life for the laws of our fathers, appealing to God to show mercy soon to our nations and by afflictions and plagues to make you confess that he alone is God. And through me, uh, through me and my brothers to bring to an end to wrath of the Almighty, which has justly fallen on our whole nation. The king fell into a rage and handled him worse than the others, being Exasperated uh, as his scorn. So he died in his integrity, putting his whole trust in the Lord. Last of all, the mother died after her sons. Let this be enough then about the eating of a sacrifice and the extreme tortures. As you can see and read the story, obviously Antiochus IV was the evil. That's why the Antiochus IV is portrayed as an evil one. And in Daniel's, as I just read, and the persecutions of the old believers, what the evil will do at the end time. Because he is a literally symbol of the evil forces itself. So, you could imagine how Israelites have died. You know to trust and follow the God's law or the Moses law and they choose to really die rather than eating or are going against the God's law and when you actually take a look at Hebrews chapter 11 for a second Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11, we're going to read from 35. Woman received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortures, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others have suffered a mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn into two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commanded through their fate, did not receive of what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that part, apart from us they should not be made perfect." This is literally the story of what happened to Jews and Israelites at the time. So Antiochus IV ruled for 39 years. And during that time, many of the Jews have either persecuted and executed. And many of the, um, the Jews rejected his commands, and fought against uh, his commands. Um, because of what he did, instead of he started controlling the Jews, 
he literally got more uh, uh, revolt and objections from them. So this is when the what you heard as Hasidim, you heard of the Hasidim, right? The the people who wear the the black hat, black coat, you know, everything black. You have seen those people even in Israel. So this is where the uh, Hasidim started, and literally the Hasidim was the source from the um, the Pharisees. The where the Pharisees started is it is actually started from originated from the word para. The in Hebrew para means it's separated. It is completely separate from other people. So Pharaoh, it is started as Hebrew, and later on in uh, the uh, the Greek word um, Pharisees. That's how the Pharisee was born. So those Pharisees is not completely religious, nor the completely uh, political. But somewhere in between, and um, most of the Hasid, Hasidims or the Pharisees wanted to follow the God's commands. Where the Sadducees, you heard about in New Testament, Sadducees are the people who are more um, aligned with the politicians and followed the commands of the, the king's order. So that's where the Pharisees and Sadducees was separated. So most of the Sadducees are more richer and they're more involved in the politics. They're more involved in the, more the, the ruling the, the countries. So this is why you see in the New Testament why the Pharisees are going against the Sadducees all the time. But in the story of the New Testament, when it comes to persecuting and killing Jesus, Pharisees and Sadducees, they're actually working together. But historical fact that they cannot mingle. They're like cats and dog. They never mingle. They never agreed on their, their belief. But when it comes to killing Jesus Christ, they, were, they became one. But from the historical fact, they're hating each other. And many of the people who actually just uh, follow the, uh, the king's order, which is the Sadducees, was hated by the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the Pharisees. So as you can see here, this is how literally, um, uh, whatchamacallit, the, uh, The revolt that started. So you can kind of understand why there is uh, the revolt um, started and what cause of this revolt. So we're going to talk about some of the Hasmoneans um, dynasties. So the, the Hasmoneans, uh, the dynasty, is a starting from, let me see if I can actually find the... Uh, Uh, let's see. Let me see if I can find a map here. Okay. Let me share this. Okay, do you see uh, my screen? Okay, so You, oh. you will see here uh, Mattathias. Mattathias is the one who actually 
led the revolt against uh, Antiochus IV. Mattathias had sons, Yohanan, Simeon, Judah, Eleazar, and Jonathan. After Mattathias was the, started the revolt, what happened here is when um, when the uh, Antiochus sent people to um, the small town um, they actually had the entire town to uh, worship the idols and pour the uh, the swine's blood. When they do that, he, Mattathias, killed those messengers. And that's how the revolt started. And after the death of Mattathias, his son, all the five sons, took the, the rules, and each of them was a great... Um, uh, the warrior, and they led the Israels, the people who wants to follow the God's command and Moses' law. He led uh, the group of people and um, the fight against the uh, uh, Seleucus, the dynasties, and uh, the uh, many of the people who followed. And respected Mattathias and his sons' lead. Um, obviously, they fought against the Seleucus, uh, the dynasty, for their independence. And they fought, and eventually, for about six and a half years, literally. The uh, Mattathias and his sons literally led all the uh, uh, Antiochus IV, the, 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 the armies, to drive out from Jerusalem. So they restored the Jerusalem and controlled the Jerusalem. It took about six, to, six and a half years to just to took the control back. And when that happened, when they drove out the Antiochus, the, the armies, out of the Jerusalem... That's when they started to celebrate. So, when you actually um, go to John, um, let me see where that is. When you go to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, read from verse 22. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So what you see here is... The Feast of Dedication. The Feast of Dedication is what we know as Hanukkah. You heard of a Hanukkah, right? During the time of a Christmas, right, you see there they uh, light up the, the candles, right? And then they started to uh, put off each candle as day goes by. That is the Feast of Dedication. That's the day that uh, Mattathias drove out all this, uh, the, the uh, Seleucus, the, the armies out of Jerusalem and restore the temples and restore the city of Jerusalem. That's what they celebrate. They restored and rededicated the temple to the Lord. So that is what it's called 
the Feast of Dedication, which is what we know as Hanukkah. Now you understand why Hanukkah is important for Jews. Of course, the, the Feast of Dedication, it is not the God's law or Moses' law. This is what they actually celebrated as they restored the city of Jerusalem and the city of a temple and clean up all their temples to restore. So this is, you know, even though as Mattathias and their sons are literally started this, the, the Feast of Dedication, so it is not part of the Moses law, but from the historical fact that for the Jews, it is very important because they restored the temple and Jerusalem. And that's what they are celebrating. So now you know the history of the Hanukkah, which is the, the Feast of Dedication. And um, as you can see here, Mattathias and his sons is, they are the descendants of uh, the priest. They're not the descendants of King David. So they do not supposed to be the kings because they don't follow the Dave's line, but they're the priest. But what happened is later on, they started to become a king and priest at the same time. They claimed them as the king while they're high priest. So therefore, there is some of the issues started. So now, as I mentioned, this revolt that started from Mattathias, but they actually called Hasmoneans dynasty. So who is the Hasmoneans? Hasmoneans, literally, Hasmonia is the, this, uh, the, is the uh, one of the ancestor of Mattathias. So they picked the uh, Mattathias ancestor's name, Hasmonia, so they called Hasmonean dynasty. And when they actually started to rule as a king, and at the same time, they're actually acting as uh, uh, the high priest. So literally, that's where problems started. But let's talk about the, after the death of all his sons of Mattathias, Simeon was the last ones to really just uh, um, to to rule the Israel, and then his son um, John uh, Hilcanus became the successor of uh, Simeon's. So John Her uh, Her 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 Hilcanus is became a king. So this is where. Um, the oldest trouble started. What trouble started? So let's talk about this for a moment. The, the John Hilcanus was an ambitious guy. He was very, very ambitious. And literally, he wanted to just to make everyone to become uh, the Jewish. And he wanted to just expand the territory as big as he could. And he not only just to rule the, the part of the Judah, and he literally invaded into uh, Edom, and he also invaded to some other region. So he literally just uh, started to uh, invade it into the land of um, the Edom. Well, for examples, as we see in the um, Herod, as I mentioned last week, the Herod is Edomite. He's not Jews. He's Edomite. But how he became a king? Because of the John Hyrcanus. So why John Hyrcanus, what did Hyrcanus had done to make the Herod the king? So what happened is, as I mentioned, the Hilcanus was a very ambitious man, and he just wanted to just expand the territory as big as he could. And when he actually invaded into Edomites, so Edomites is a Hebrew word, and 
Greek word is um, the uh, um, idumes. Idumes is Edomite in Greek. Edomians was invaded by the Hyrcanus, and what he did was he forcefully circumcised the Edomites. According to the Moses law, when the pagans decide to convert to become the Jews, they have to be circumcised. So there are people who are born as Jews, and there are people who are not born as the Jews or the descendants of Abraham, but they converted to Jews. In order, in order for the non-Jews to become a Jews, they have to be circumcised and they must follow the Moses law. Then they accept it as the Jews. So when John Hyrcanus invaded into the Ed, uh, Edom, he forcefully circumcised everybody to become Jews. So not by their choice, because of their force, the Hil by the, the force of the Hyrcanus, Edomites became Jews. Even though they're not originally descendants of Abraham, but they forcefully became Jews. So this is why later Herod was able to become a king of Israel because by nature, he's not a descendant of Abraham, but because he became a Jew by force and all the, the Edomites became a Jews. So, uh, So understanding the uh, John Hilcanus is very important because he's the one who uh, converted uh, Edomians and uh, for other regions to to force other people to become Jews. So let's talk about um, after the uh, death of John Hilcanus. Um, Before we actually uh, talk about the death of Hilcanus, so one times he actually um, called um, many of the people into his palace, and he thought that he was actually was a good king, and he was uh, he was uh, his policy was really good. And he was pleased with what, how he was actually just uh, ruling the countries. So while he actually brought all these people into the palace and, and, and offered them the food and drinks, and everybody just bowed down before him and said, oh, you're the great kings and you, you're, you're doing a great things for, for the people of Israel. You know, we're happy with everything, what you're doing and, and so forth. Everybody was uh, brown nosing to the uh, Hilcanus. And there is one of the men, his name is Eliasar, And he literally just had, a, I guess, a, you know, lots of drink or something. I'm not sure what, what happened to him. But he said... Uh, it doesn't matter how well you're doing now, but you're not a king. You're the descendants of a priest. So I want you to step down as a king and you're not the descendants of a King David. So you're not supposed to be the king. And you have to become a, just a priest, not a king. So he was honestly and transparently spoken to uh, Hilcanus. And you could imagine, he wanted to actually gather people 
to show off how great he is and how much like you know he's actually doing for his own you know own his people and everybody else was brown nosing to him and he said how happy they are and you're the kings you're the greatest and blah 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 and this guy the Eleazar showed up and he said you're not supposed to be a king so what do you think would happen <laughs> Hilcanus was furious and he was very upset and he was not happy at all you know this guy was speaking and Eleazar obviously he's a Pharisee <laughs> he was a fair Pharisees so he just hated Pharisees and then after death of Hilcanus He's a son, Alexander uh, Yenius became a king. And this Alexander knew what happened to his father, Hilcanus. And therefore, he automatically started to hate Pharisees. And he was a really bad king to begin with. And he, he, is, he is a Sadducees. So I told you before that Pharisees and Sadducees, they're like, they're cats and dogs. They hate each other. And he started to persecute Pharisees. And then, since he was persecuting so many of uh, the Pharisees, the Pharisees could not handle the persecutions from the Alexander. So, Pharisees reached out to Assyrians and asked for help. So, Pharisees reached out to Assyrians to really protect them and help them. And then they literally pulled the Assyrian into the land of the, the soil of Israel. And then realized, wait a second, if I continue to do this, and if we pulled Assyrian into the, the soil of uh, the Israel, instead of we're trying to just protect ourselves, we may be able to eaten up by the uh, Assyrians. So... When Assyrian came to the city of Jerusalem, they started to rape Israelites' women, and they tried to just plunder it into the, some of the cities. And and what they thought was, we tried to just to kill the uh, the the fox, and we brought the uh, the tiger into the, uh, the the to the city. So he, the Pharisees went back to. Uh, the Alexander and said, "We're sorry. We brought the Assyrian to the soil of uh, the Israel." So he reached out to the Alexander to defeat the Assyrians. So they came together and they defeated the Assyrians and drove them out of the land of Israel. So they were celebrating that they actually drove out the Assyrians out of the the land of Israel. Alexander turned to Pharisees and saying, Ha ha! You're the one who brought the Assyrian into the soil of Israel. You deserve to be persecuted. So what happened was, he brought the Pharisees who brought the Assyrians, and 800 Pharisees, he crucified them. 800 of them. On the cross, all the Pharisees who brought this disaster upon Israel and literally imagine in the big um, the uh, open space, he literally put 800 cross and crucified each in every of them on the cross. And not only uh Crucify them, literally hang them for weeks, 
and let them die. So you could imagine how mad many of the Pharisees would have been. Right? It was just nightmare for the Pharisees. And then, not only that, they brought the Pharisees, the families, brought to, the, to, this, to this open space and had their family to watch their father die on a cross. And then, not only that, while their father was crucified on a cross, he literally pulled the tongues out of their sons and cut them in front of them. And then cut their ears. And you could imagine how much hate and furious the Pharisee would, would have been. And then after this incident, Alexander died. And he was really bad. Not only he was actually bad, he was just... Um, he killed his brother Antigonus because he wanted to secure his, his kingship. And also... Uh, Salome, which is the uh, the uh, the sisters, put him in prison. Uh, no, actually, not Salome was put put into prison. Aristobulus, which is another brothers, put him into prison. So he killed one of his brother. He killed. Uh, he put his brothers into the uh, um, the prison. One of them died, one of them actually put into prison. And the uh, Alexander, Salome was not actually a sister, he was the wife of the Alexander. So what, ha what happened was, after he crucified 800 Pharisees, and after not long, he actually died. But before he died, what he said to his wife, Salome, he said, you know what? As I think about it, I think I had done wrong to Pharisees. So he regret what he did before he died. And he said, uh, uh, when you rule this countries after me just say sorry to Pharisees and he died and after the death of Alexander Salome he actually a she now became a queen and she invited all the families of the Pharisees and then you could imagine how Pharisee would have felt when Salome was invited all the, the Pharisees of family. They were afraid that Salome would, would you know, uh, kill the rest of the Pharisees. But instead, Salome said, I'm so sorry what my, my husband had done. It is not something he should have done to Pharisees at all. So, I felt so bad, it really it was a heartbreaking moment when my husband was a killing all your fathers and your families. I did not agree with my husband. So, I'm not going to persecute you at all. Instead, do whatever is necessary if you want to just like dug up my husband's grave, do so. If you want. I'm not going to object to that. So. If that is going to. Help you. To revenge. My husband. Please do so. I want to make a peace treatment with you. 
and I will support you going forward and do whatever is necessary. But then, since Salome was coming out this way, obviously the people of uh, Pharisee would not really dig up his, you know, her husband's uh, grave and destroyed the corpse. So, I'm sorry, we, we're the one who caused this problem. We're the one who actually brought the Assyrians into this soil. So, we have done wrong, and your husband had done wrong. So, let's reconcile. So, Salome, the queen, is the one who reconciled between Pharisees and the queen. And what happened is Salome released his uh, brother-in-law, Aristobulus, from the prison. So he's supposed to be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the sons of Hilcanus. So Salome gave the, the power to Aristobulus, which is the brother uh, the. the brother-in-law and then later Salome married to Aristobulus she was a good queen and then um, Aristobulus um, was a start to rule and Salome was actually helping Aristobulus to continue to rule the land of uh, Israel. And Salome died. And after Salome died, uh, between the Aristobulus and Salome, there are two sons. There's Hilcanus the second and Aristobulus the second. And literally, um, According to the law, since Salome reconciled with the Pharisees, Pharisees wanted to follow the uh, Jewish customs. And Jewish custom that the first sons succeed the kingship. So the first sons of um To become a king after the death of Aristobulus, they wanted to bring the uh, Hilcanus the Seconds as a king. Um, but the Sadducees liked the Aristobulus the Seconds. So there is another conflict between the Pharisees and Sadducees. So they are start the fighting. Pharisees are supporting Hilcanus the Seconds. And Sadducees is supporting the Aristobulus the seconds. So obviously, there is the literally, you know, the war between the two brothers. And um, since then, Sadducees and Pharisees, they're completely segregated and they're parted between the two. Uh, the groups and uh, Hilcanus the seconds proclaimed that well I have no interest in politics because he was afraid of his brother Aristobulus the second and he literally just gave the power to his brother Aristobulus the second and then he went to uh, um he went to uh, he went to the Edom, and there's a the guy named Antipater. Antipater was the one who accepted the uh, Hilcanus the second, and Antipater was the one who was very, very wise, and he was just a smart guy, 
who wanted to utilize this opportunity to gain the power. And then he, was, he wanted to use the Hilcanus II as a leverage to gain the power. And he was supporting Hilcanus II. And then continued to really just uh, kind of like um, talk to him and said, you should be in power. You should control this. And continued to really just kind of like whisper into his ears that, why did you give up your own power? You should restore that power back from your brothers. And then since he was to keep hearing from Antipater about his power ship, and he said, why did I give up my own power? That should be mine. And then they tried to plot to drive out Aristobulus II. But since Aristobulus II's his power is strong in Jerusalem, they were just to keep fighting each other. And then general from Rome's Pompeius. You probably heard of his name, Pompeius. Is Pompeius from, uh, from Rome's, he smelled something was going on between the two. <laughs> he sensed it. And he said, hey, Helcanus the second, do you want me to help you? Well, what do you think the Helcanus would say? <laughs> Hooray! Yeah! Romans should <laughs> help me! <laughs> So, the Pompeius actually just um, was to decide to uh, uh, to join up to drive out Aristobulus. Now, here's the story. This Antipater II is the Herod. Remember I told you the, the uh, Hilcanus II went to... Uh, Antipater and Edomites, right? That is Herod Antipater II. And as I mentioned, he had uh, ambitions that he wanted to have a control of Israel. And he wanted to leverage the Hilcanus II to really just get control of this land of Israel. And later, because of the power that he received from the Roman, which is the Pompeius, they drove out the Aristobulus the seconds out of Israel. And then Hilcanus the seconds gained the power. So now he became the king. But he was a literally puppet. Who has the power behind? There is that is the Herod Antipater the second. He's the one literally controlling the Hilcanus the second. So Hilcanus did not have any power whatsoever, but the Herod behind the scene was literally controlling the Hilcanus to control the, uh, the land of Israel. So Antipater, later on, he was a genius and he was a politician and he was literally just working very closely with the Romans. And then after his, he, the, and after the Antipater uh, the second died, he's a son, which is the, the Herod the Great. The Herod the Great is the one that we see in Matthew chapter 2. He's the sons of the Herod Antipater the second. Herod the Great is the sons of him. So obviously, he learned all the politics from his father. And he knew exactly how to really just leverage the Romans to gain the power. And then, because the, the uh, Herod literally started to have the true power behind the Hilcanus the seconds, and um, even though he, after the death of Hilcanus II, um, Methodius Antigonus became a king, but he was also 
the literally the puppet. And there was Alexandra was a killed by the Herod, and another Alexander was a killed by the Pompeius. So even though Mattathias Antigonus became a king, literally he had no power whatsoever. And then uh Um, what else I can uh, tell? So let's talk about the Hilcanus the second a little more before we actually just move it to the next generations. So, uh, Hilcanus the seconds, um, when he was ruling, Antipater the seconds supported Julius Caesar. And he was the one who actually just supported him and led the uh, Julius Caesars to, um, to cross the Sinai's, the, the land. And he was the one who was led him. And he was a successful. And because of that, he was the guidance of Julius Caesar. He bought Julius Caesar's heart. And Antipater II received the Roman citizenship because of that. So now he became a Roman's citizenship, and then he asked for the power and the control of the Palestinians' govern uh, governance. So Julius Caesar's was received officially from Julius Caesar's to govern the city of a Palestinian. And obviously, as I mentioned, Antipater II is the father of a Herod the, the Great. And uh, Antipater II made his son, which is uh, the Herod the Great, to become uh, the governor of the Galilee. And After he actually became the rulers of a Galilee, obviously Herod the Great was even smarter and it was a great politician than his father, um, Antipater II. And he was literally going back and forth between the Romans and trying to gain more power. And... Uh, After the Hilcanus II uh, died, his son, Mattathias Antigonus, the, uh, the king, obviously um, he, was, he didn't really have a much of a power because the Herod, the great, was, was started to really just uh, to gain more power than anything else. Um, after he was a supporting, the Herod was a supporting the Romans, uh, he received a lot more controls and powers from the Romes, and he continued to offer or gave the money and gave the treasures to uh to Romans em empire to um to offer them that he wants to expand the Jerusalem so when you, as i mentioned most of the structures and architectures in Jerusalem i told you that Herod is the one who actually built the most of the uh the architectures because he was interested in uh architect and he literally just built the most of uh, structures in Jerusalem and restores. And uh, uh, to gain the more power. And then after the Julius Caesar died and uh, Octavianus, which is the, uh, what we know as in the um, uh, 
when you go back to uh, let's see when you go back to uh, Luke, Book of Luke chapter 2 Verse 1 says this, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. So, at the time, the Caesar Augustus, he was the one who was ruling Rome at the time. And Herod was to give all his um, offering to uh Augustus, he's Octavianus in historical fact. So even though the Bible says Augustus, his real name is Octavianus. And he's the one who promote Herod to be the uh, um, um, the power in the regions. So after the Mattathias Antigos died and Aristobulus II became a king and Herod literally killed Aristobulus II. So, after the Aristobulus II was killed by the Herod, that's the end of Hasmonean's empire because there is no more descendants after Aristobulus. And then Herod took over the power from Hasmonean Empire into his hand. So that's how Herod the Great became a king of their region. So you can see the historical fact from you know the war between um, the. Uh, Seleucus versus Ptolemy, the 150 years of Assyrian war, and then how Mattathias started the revolt, and how the Hasmonean Empire started, and how the Hasmonean Empire ended with the Aristobulus II, and how Herod gained the power of Israel. So, do you get the ideas of exactly how the power shifted from um, the Hasmonean Empire to uh, Herod? So let me see if I can show other map. Hmm. Okay, here's another map. You see the map here? So this is the uh, the family tree of a Herod. This Antipater is the one who I mentioned about the Antipater the seconds, which is the father of Herod the Great, right? So obviously Herod the Great had other brothers. And then there's a bunch of other uh, people underneath, which we're going to talk about a little more about this later on. Because in the Bible, you will hear a lot of the Herod, but not every Herod's the same. They just happen to have a Herod as a name. So, for example, when you go to uh, Matthew chapter, chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 19. But when Herod died, this Herod is the Herod the Great. An angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard it, uh, Archelaus 
was regaining over Judea in pl uh, place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in the city called the Nazareth, so that what was a spoken by the prophet uh, might be fulfilled, that he would be called Nazarian. So you will hear Archelaus. Archelaus is right here. You see this, uh, the family tree here? So what you will see is, you will hear the Philip the I, Archelaus, Antipatus, and Philip the Second, and also Agrippa I and Agrippa II in our Bible. So these are all the families of Herod. So you will see that Archelaus is the one of here, which we saw in Matthew chapter 2. So we're going to talk about a lot more about the, uh, the Herod's of families and how he's you know, how he's, uh, the family uh, started to rule in Israel after the Herod the Great. Any questions about the uh, this historical fact of uh, Herod's and how he gained the power in Israel? No? Okay, so everyone understood... Um, so the fact that I just went over. All right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to give you another homework to do. Okay. So let me share my screen again one more time. So the folders that I mentioned, which you have all access to, there is a called, the document called the King Herod. King Herod. Um, well, since you have a lot of reading to do, I'm not going to ask you to read or to finish this uh, reading this, uh, this uh, files by next week. But I want you to, I want you to read this. Uh, there's about like 40 pages. It's not a whole lot to read when you think about it, uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of time to read this to give a little more background on King Herod. Okay, so the file name is a King Herod's uh, King Herod PDF. All right, that's a homework. Once again, uh, I'm not going to ask you to uh, read until next week, but at least take your time. After you finish reading the first Maccabees and second Maccabees and read this, uh, the King Herod will help you understand the, some of the things that I mentioned. Okay. Um, I supposed to go over the uh, Matthew chapter two, but unfortunately, it's just kind of time is running out right now. So let's just uh, finish the uh, uh, today's session here. Then we'll continue on from the, uh, the chapter two next week. Okay, any question?